ನಮಃ ವಂಚಕೌಪಾತರುಭ್ಯಸ್ಯಾಕ್ರಿಪಸಿಂಧು ವೈ ಎವ ಪತಿತನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭೋ ನಿತ್ಯನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗಧಾಧಾರ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸದಿ ಗೋಡ್ ಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ ಹರೆ ಸೊ ವಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ವನ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಆನ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಅಟ್ ದ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಬೈ ಬಾಬ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆನ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟು ಟು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಬಿಗಿನಿಂಗ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ನಂಬರ್ ನೈನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ನಂಬರ್ ನೈನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ಸರ್ಸ್ ಬೈ ಸೈಟಿಂಗ್ ದ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಫ್ಯಾಷನ್ is everyone seeing the screen yes yes hari krishna nice to hear your choking voice again <laughs> all right so we heard chapter 8 we heard Maharaj Pariksit put many questions to Srila Sukadeva Goswami. And so Sukadeva Goswami is going to answer them. And one of the questions which he put way back in text number, text number 8, I think it was text 8, the first question which he put, uh, let's just look back to that question uh, take seven was it can you read the question Prabhu yes chapter chapter eight text yes text chapter eight text number seven so the translation is O learned Brahmana, the transcendental spirit soul is different from the material body. Does he acquire the body accidentally or by some cause? Will you kindly explain this for it is unknown to you? All right. So this is the question and this is the subject matter of the first three verses of this chapter. Sukadeva Goswami is replying to this first question with these first three verses. and you can see in the very first text he says the relationship is just like a dreamer seeing his own body working hmm. there's and he says also there's no meaning to the relationship of the part of the pure soul with the material body so this is uh very interesting of course we are in the dreaming condition we identify with the material body and we play different roles and someone's you know the husband somebody's the wife the father the mother the teacher the worker the servant you were playing all of these different roles we identify ourselves in different ways different designations and we may even dream about being king we want to be the king or sometimes we dream that the tiger is coming and the tiger is going to eat me so tiger is come actually there's no tiger but because the person's dreaming he thinks there's a tiger coming and he's in danger from the tiger but somebody may be right next to the the person who's dreaming and he thinks what's the problem there's no danger there's no tiger but because of the dream the person is afraid 
So I was reading uh, Bury John Prabhu's presentation of this chapter in his book, Unveiling the Lotus Feet. And Bury John Prabhu quotes a lecture which was given on this very verse by Srila Prabhupada in 1970 when he was in Tokyo. Of course, Bury John had been there in Tokyo, in Tokyo at that time. Uh, it's very interesting that he, he was there at that time and he remembered the lecture and he quoted, he's, he's put a lot of, the, a big major portion of that lecture there in his uh, presentation on this section of the first chapter. So anyway, Prabhupada speaks about the dreaming condition. Um, actually, he said, Prabhupada explains, there's no question of falling. You know, we think, oh, I'm a fallen soul. But actually, there, it, that's not true. The soul is not fallen. But we may be thinking we're fallen. It, it's our own thinking which is fallen. Actually, we're not fallen, but we're thinking we're fallen. And Srila Prabhupada goes on to explain, he said, in the same way, once we understand that, that we're not actually fallen, then that condition that can be immediately ended. Just like the dream, you can immediately wake up and come out of the dream. And so in the same way, this illusion, this identification with the material body can immediately be overcome. We come back to our proper consciousness. So, th this is uh, how Srila Prabhupada explains this verse, actually. If you have Bar Barijan Prabhu's book, I encourage you, please do read the transcription of this uh, lecture. You may, or you may have Prabhupada's lectures, you can listen to Prabhupada's lecture on this particular verse. 1970 in Tokyo, and Prabhupada explaining about this illusion, this dreaming condition. So I, I've marked some portion of the purport here. I thought it would be nice to, to read some of it for you, just to hear, because I know you're all busy, you have a lot of things to do. Uh, so Prabhupada is written here, now the next question automatically made will be why the Lord influences the living entity to such consciousness and forgetfulness. The answer is that the Lord clearly wishes that every living entity be in his pure consciousness as a part and parcel of the Lord, and thus be engaged <coughs> in loving service of the Lord, as he is constitutionally made. But because the living entity is partially independent also, he may not be willing to serve the Lord, but may try to become as independent as the Lord is. All the non-devotee living entities are desirous of becoming equally as powerful as the Lord, although they are not fit to become so. The living entities are illusioned by the will of the Lord because they want to become like Him, like a person who thinks of becoming a king without possessing the necessary qualification. When the living entity desires to become the Lord himself, he is put in a condition of dreaming that he is king. Therefore, the first sinful will of the living entity is to become the Lord, and the consequent will of the Lord is that the living entity forgets his factual life, and thus, and thus dream of the land of utopia where he may become one 
like the Lord. Uh, so this is the condition, our condition, but our fault. Our, we're in this condition. We, we, we have these material desires. Prabhupada talks about dreaming of becoming a king. And so Krishna arranges, Lord Krishna arranges to fulfill our desires in some way by dreaming. We dream of these different things. So it's all due to our independent nature that we are conditioned souls. And we have that mentality that we would like to be the Lord of the material nature. But when we come out of that condition, then we will come to the proper consciousness of the mood of being the servant. And Prabhupada nicely explains this example about the king that you have to be qualified to become a king, you know, who can be a king? There's some very special karma, very special qualities required to be a king. So, in a similar manner, we're, we are desiring to be the, the lord of the material nature. We want to lord over the material nature. And this, is, this point is discussed, it's expanded in the second text where Sukadeva Goswami goes on to describe about how the living entity develops a consciousness in terms of I and mind. We have this concept that this is mine, right? Who's thinking this is mine? The karmi, those who are fruit of worker. They're thinking this is mine, this belongs to me. Or they're thinking, I gave this, I did this, I gave this charity, I donated this. You know, they're thinking themselves, they're thinking, I gave something, I gave what was mine. Actually, nothing is ours. So, this is the, the fruit of mentality, we're thinking, this is mine. And then the other problem is, we're thinking in terms of I. And the, the, this I problem, this is the problem of the jnani. The jnani is thinking that I am the Lord. I am one with the Supreme. This mentality. So this, this conception, of course, the, the conception of I is even more dangerous than the conception of mind. The jnani, his illusion to think that it can become one with the Supreme. The karmi wants to control the material world. And when he fails, when he sees he cannot actually be, control the material world, then he, th he gives up the mind and he thinks in terms of I, and he thinks I can become the Supreme. I can become the, the Supreme Controller, the Supreme Lord. So these two conceptions are very prominent in conditioned life and that's what causes our entanglement in the material world, the illusion of material life. Prabhupada writes here in the final purport of this, this final paragraph of this purport of text number two, the different positions of the living entities in the material world under multifarious manifestations of bodies are due to the misconception of mind and I. The karmi thinks of this world as mine and the jnani thinks I am everything. The whole material conception of politics sociology, philanthropy, altruism, etc., conceived by the conditioned souls is on the basis of this misconceived I and mine, which are products of a strong desire to enjoy material life. Identi identification with the body 
and the place where the body is obtained under different conceptions of socialism, nationalism, family affection and so on and so forth is all due to forgetfulness of the real nature of the living entity. And the whole misconception of the bewildered living entity can be removed by the association of Sukadeva Goswami. And Maharaj Parikshit, as all this is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada analyzing the problem and then telling us also the solution. The solution, of course, is you have to get the right association. You have to hear from the devotees and in this way understand what is our actual situation. Then text number three continues. As soon as the living entity becomes situated in his constitutional glory and begins to enjoy the transcendence beyond time and material energy, he at once gives up the two misconceptions of life, I and mine, and thus becomes fully manifested as the pure self. So, of course, this is the idea, we want to come to this concept, we want to understand our actual self. Thinking in terms of I and mine, this is the material, the animals are thinking this is mine. The, uh, the animals are good karmis. And Prabhupada said, this misconception of mine is perceivable even in the category of cats and dogs who fight with one another with the same misconception of mine. I've been living here in Mayapur, at the Mayapur Institute, and there's a lot of birds around here. And we, I often see the birds, and I see the birds fight with each other. I can see the, the you know, two birds fighting with each other, and flap their wings, and I can understand they're having some argument, some disagreement. It's, it's, so, uh, it's so surprising, you know, you never think that birds, you think birds are peaceful, but I can see they have a lot of problems, they often disagree and fight with each other. And so even in the bird species of life, this, this kind of thing is going on. They're thinking in terms of mine, this belongs to me, this is mine, this is my tree, I live on this branch. This is my food. And then Pra Prabhupada continues further on in the purport. The misconception of I am the Lord or I am the Supreme is more dangerous than the misconception of mine. Now why would you think that? Someone like to tell why why would it be more dangerous to think I am the Lord or I am the Supreme? What's the danger? What's that problem? I couldn't hear you clearly. Aham Brahmasmi, I am the Lord. I am Brahman. With this understanding, I am the Lord. Aham Brahmasmi, yes, I, I am the Lord. So what's the danger with that? He tries to compete with the Lord. Lord is the Lord, so I am also such a Lord. Independent of Lord, you want to enjoy. Your voice, you know, could you do, I think it's something, your mic is not very good or something. Voice is not clear. Were you able to hear everything? Judy Gopi? Um, it was really, his voice was really good. Right. Yeah. Maybe just maybe move closer to the mic or something. Well, he with the Lord. He with the Lord. No. Raji, you can um, write your answer in the chat box. Then we can read it out aloud. Like that is easier. 
Does anybody else like to try and reply to this? I'm, I want to understand what is the danger of thinking I am the Lord? Why is it considered more dangerous than the misconception of mine? Dhananjaya, what do you think? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, I, uh, I mostly stand for as uh, mm. that is more signifying this Aham Brahas, uh, Brahmasmi. So, that is signifying about uh, giving the importance of self that it is equivalent, equivalent to the Lord. While the mind, it is more... Uh, in material nature where it uh, uh, belongs to us. So, I is more centered about where the his, his soul is comparing with the Lord, but mind more comparing in the material nature uh, only. So, mind is less competitive than I is more uh, individual centric in, 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 in competitions with the Lord. So probably that is the reason I is more dangerous than mine. Oh, you're, you're saying that I am the Lord, or I am the Supreme, this is competitive, that it's the idea of competing with the Lord. Yes, yes, Maharaj. the concept of somebody being the possessor that this is mine this belongs to me that that would be limited yeah limited to the material thing which is which is there and again material thing was originally belongs to somebody else but right now it is mine but yes still when we say mine Still, we are giving the supremacy of the Lord, but when we, when we say I, then it is more in competitive nature. We are competing with the uh, Lord. That's why probably I is, though fundamentally both belongs to the uh, Lord, so uh, both are dangerous, but mine is uh, in less competitive with the Lord. It is only signifying this. Uh, possessiveness of the material nature but it is no way competing with the Lord so uh, so this mind is more uh, in the mode of ignorance but I is more in the mode of envy that's maybe passion well I don't and the mood of envy said so there's a, the mood that I am the one that could it could simply be the the desire to merge and become one with the Supreme and think of himself in, in the terms of unity with the Supreme. But the concept of devotion to, the, the, there's no concept of having a relationship with the Lord. If I am the Lord, or I am the Supreme, if, you, if one is in that consciousness, then everyone could come up to that Everyone could say, say like that. But if you're the Lord, then I am also the Lord. And in this way, there's so much conflict between people because each person, each individual is thinking themselves to be the Supreme. And that in itself, that there's no hope of any kind of harmony or devotion. But that conception is also there, you could say, in, the concept, in terms of thinking of self, this is mine, you think this belongs to me. Well, that, the, the, the idea is we want more, and we always want to increase and get more, and there's no limit to what we want. And we want to expand the empire. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes the demonic mentality so much do I have today, and I will get more tomorrow. And whoever is my enemy, I will have them killed. So, <laughs> so this is the concept of mine. But the, then in, in terms of the concept of thinking I, I am the Lord, 
but then the, there's no scope for recognizing the existence of the of the, any supreme personality of Godhead. We're simply thinking everyone is God. So that, that in itself is very dangerous. If we think everyone is God, everyone can become God. So there's no there's no a, a, there's no aspect of a supreme being there. So when there's no aspect of the Supreme, that means when Lord Krishna comes, then people will minimize him and, and they will think of him, of him to be an ordinary person. Yes? I want to share something. On yeah. this point, yes, like, please. Uh, what I understood by this discussion that uh, uh, the concept of mine is uh, mm, the concept of I am the Lord is like all pervasive. If you, it means I am the Lord and everything is my property, but the concept of mine is limited to the thing which the one is attached to, like this is mine. So, in that way, there is a scope that he can become uh, spiritually attached by getting the mercy of the devotees and other. Um, but when he is thinking that I am the Lord or I am the Supreme, then that way, as we say, last snare of Maya. So there is a little scope of his becoming Krishna conscious. Okay. Thank yeah. Thank you. It's certainly. Uh, the Gyanis, the they get into, the, when the people fall into this path of speculation, then it's very difficult to get them out of it, to get them to give up that concept of being the Supreme. Impersonalism is something which we have to constantly deal with and generally the solution for impersonalist philosophy is that simply arguing with people is often not really enough that it's difficult to convince people in the kali yuga people don't like to admit they're wrong what they need to come out of that impersonal concept they need to have a lot of kirtan a nice prasadam and that kirtan, chanting of the holy names, has to come from devotees. They have to hear the holy name from the devotees, and they need also the Lord's prasadam. And these, these kind of things can help a lot for people just to develop a taste for the personal concept of Krishna. But simply arguing with people, it's very difficult to get them to give up that concept. But at the same time, we, we, can, we should be able to understand how ludic ludicrous it is to think that I am the Lord, that I am the Supreme. When we ourselves as individuals are so limited and we're so much subject to the miseries of the material world. So what kind of Supreme are we? Anyway, we are trying to preach the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to end this consciousness, this concept of thinking that I am the Supreme. We'd like to get people out of this illusion. Just a bit more from the purport, Prabhupada writes, There is no profit in denying the supremacy of the Lord who is the controller of all energies, but one should be constitutionally situated in one's own glory, namely to be situated in the pure consciousness of being the eternal servitor of the Lord. In his conditional life, the living entity is servant of the illusory maya, and in his liberated state, 
He is the pure, unqualified servant of the Lord. To become untinged by the modes of material nature is a qualification for entering into the service of the Lord. As long as one is a servant of mental concoction, one cannot be completely free from the disease of I and mine. So this is a problem, this is a disease. Of course, the solution is bhakti yoga. And Prabhupada continues in the purport, so the science of bhakti yoga, of worshipping the Lord, glorifying the Lord, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from the right source, not from the professional man, but from a person who is Bhagavatam in life, and being always in the association of pure devotees, should be adopted in earnestness. One should not be misled by misconceptions of I and mine. The karmis are fond of the conception of mine and the jnanis are fond of the conception of I. And both of them are unqualified to be free from the bondage of the illusory energy. Srimad Bhagavatam and primarily Bhagavad Gita are both meant for delivering a person from the misconception of I and mine. And Srila Vyasadeva transcribed them for the deliverance of the fallen souls. The living entity has to be situated in the transcendental position, where there is no more influence of time, nor of the material energy. In conditioned life, the living entity is subjected to the influence of time in the dream of past, present and future. The mental speculator tries to conquer the influence of time by future speculations of becoming Vasudev or the Supreme Lord by means of culturing knowledge and conquering over ego. But the process is not perfect. The perfect process is to accept Lord Vasudev as the Supreme in everything. And the best perfection in culturing knowledge is to surrender unto Him, because He is the source of everything. Only in that conception can one get rid of the misconception of I and mine. Both Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam confirm it. Srila Vyasadeva has specifically contributed to the illusion living entities, the science of God and the process of Bhakti Yoga in his great literature, Srimad Bhagavatam. And the conditioned soul should fully take advantage of this great science. So in this way, Sulavya, uh, this way we see uh, the first question of Maharaj Parikshit is being answered by Sukadeva Goswami. And then Sukadeva Goswami continues to describe more. Uh, and he's describing about Lord Brahma. How Lord Maharaj Brahma... What? The screen sharing has stopped. Screen sharing has stopped? Really? Let me see. Can you see it now? Now it's there, yeah? Okay, so Sukadeva goes, Swami goes on to describe about how Lord Brahma uh, got, had a vision of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
he actually, the Lord actually appeared to him, being pleased by his penance. Now penance, usually penance, you know, we think of it that maybe we do it as an atonement. We've done something wrong, you know, I, you know I, I, maybe I, I deviated from the path of Krishna consciousness, I should do some atonement, as I, I should do some penance. You know, maybe I shouldn't eat tasty food anymore, I shouldn't eat sweets anymore, I should reduce my sleeping, some, I should do more chant, some kind of penance like that. So here also, it's mentioned Lord Brahma also did penance, but he didn't do penance just as an atonement. Lord Brahma did, he underwent penance for the purpose of actually giving pleasure to the Supreme Lord. And it's pointed out that Lord Brahma, he didn't just simply want the power to create. He wasn't doing penance just to get the power to do the creation. But his purpose in performing the penances was to actually give pleasure to the Supreme Lord Krishna, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You could say Lord Narayan, Lord Vishnu, whatever. Uh, so Lord Brahma underwent penance, and Srila Prabhupada also talks how duty of devotees, that we should also undergo penance. We have to be steadfast and willing to accept some uh, difficulties in the course of devotional service. This point will come out more as we go through this chapter. Alright, so the, uh, there are some points here in this verse I wanted to bring to you, to your attention. Prabhupada writes, the wrong conception of the jivatma is to identify the material body with the pure soul, right? That's the wrong conception. First of all, we're thinking, I am the body. So that's the wrong understanding of the jivatma. He's thinking, I am the body. And the wrong conception of the paramatma is to think the paramatma is on an equal level with the living entity. In other words, he can't distinguish between the level, the paramatma and the living entity. He thinks there's simply one, they're simply equal. But the paramatma is the upadrasta, the anumanta, the overseer, the permitter. He's observing everything. There is a difference between paramatma and the living entity. We are subordinate. We're in the subordinate position. Srila Sukadeva Goswami therefore says that for purification of both wrong conceptions, the Lord presented his eternal form before Brahmaji, being fully satisfied by Brahma's non deceptive vow of discharging bhakti yoga. So, Prabhupada then says, even or except for bhakti yoga, any method for realization of atma tattva or the science of atma will prove deceptive in the long run. Our only hope is devotional service. You have to take up devotional service. It's only by devotion. So this point is coming out again. And then Brahma undertook great penance in performing bhakti yoga and thus he was able to see the transcendental form of the Lord. His transcendental form is 100% spiritual and one can see him only by spiritualized vision after proper discharge of tapasya or penance in pure bhakti yoga. So this this is actually the penance which is being talked about, that we have to do bhakti yoga, we have to submerge ourselves in, in the intense practice of bhakti yoga, which begins with hearing and chanting. 
So we are encouraged, you have to hear, you have to chant for a long time and in this way. How long did Brahma do his penance for? How A spiritual year. One thousand, what years? Celestial year. One thousand celestial years. Yes, one thousand celestial years, you know, not a, not a short time, you know. We do a little bit, chant, we do a couple of hours chant, chanting in the morning, we think, oh, tapasya. Yeah. In, in, in relation with Brahma, this is only a fraction of seconds. So, if he's seeing his in, in his own perspective, it must be a pretty short while for him. This, if we see it in his own perspective, this must be what? It will be a fraction of seconds for him because he lived for uh, trillions, his daytime is itself a trillions of years. All right, years. but don't minimize his efforts. It's the beginning of the creation and he's alone. We have to appreciate what he did. He went through that austerity. He simply undertook that penance and he got the results. Now we can't say, oh, it was nothing, he only did it for a short time, it's only a fraction of his life. And <laughs> no, we, we have to appreciate that he did something. You know, maybe you can say like that, it's not a big portion of his life, but, you know, we should appreciate that he did it. He did please the Lord. And that's not an easy thing to do. And so we don't want to minimize the efforts of a devotee like Lord Brahma. We want to appreciate. Just one more point. One can understand the difference by the process of bhakti-yoga. Brahma was then told by the Lord the gist of Śrīmad-Bhāgavatam in four original verses. So we will come to that. There's up in verses like, I think it's 32, 33, they'll begin the, the Chatur Sloki bhagavatam is coming up. We want to go through the earlier sections of this chapter first. <coughs> Text number five, Lord Brahma, the first spiritual master, supreme in the universe, could not trace out the source of his lotus seat. And while thinking of creating the material world, he could not understand the proper direction for such creative work, nor could he find out the process for such creation. So Sukadeva Goswami is explaining about the process of creation, how did it all come about. And Prabhupada explains in the purport, the kingdom of God is not a myth, but factually a different and transcendental sphere of planets known as the Vaikuntas. This will be explained in this chapter. So there's the material world and the spiritual world. The Lord has his own abode. He lives in the spiritual world. Lord Brahma has to create the planets from this material world. He has to arrange the situations. So then text 6, while Brahma was just thinking in this way, he heard two syllables joined together. Two syllables from the Sparsha alphabet, Ta and Pa. So when joined together, they become the well of the renounced order of life. The wealth of the renounced order of life, tapa, austerity, right? That's very nice. Rich, someone's rich in austerity. That is a very special wealth. In the Kali Yuga, we don't get people very fond of that kind of wealth, but it's particularly mentioned here. And we do want to appreciate that kind of wealth. How would you understand somebody rich in austerity? What do they have to do? 
How would you recognize someone, Jyoti Gopi, somebody who's rich in austerity? Um, he's ready to give up everything. Yeah, he can give up every, every, anything he possesses. Yeah. Not attached. And, not attached to anything. Not attached to anything, and not becomes affected by gain or loss of anything. Not affected by the illusory energy. No attraction to enjoy material life. He can live anywhere. He can he eat. He can eat also in a simple manner. Sometimes he eats, sometimes he doesn't. Yeah. Yes, somebody has their hand up here. Is it uh, the, the Diksha Madhiji? Oh, Madhiji, your microphone. Oh, yeah. Maharaj, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Maharaj, uh, one who is fearless, like the sannyasis, uh, who has completely taken shelter of the Lord, and one who doesn't waste even a single moment, like some devotees, we go in Vrindavan, we see they are always chanting the Lord's name. So these are some of the symptoms okay. of devotees who are austere. Rich, they're rich in austerity, eh? the wealth of the renounced order of life. Okay, thank you. Yes, someone else has their hand up here. Yes. Uh, Marthaji, in, in the Bhagavad Slapopa says that Rama was initiated into the 18 letter Krishna Mantra, which is generally accepted by all the devotees of Lord Krishna. So, 18 letter Krishna Mantra, what is that? Uh, what is the, the 18? I'd have to count the letters of the different mantras to tell you. Do any, does anyone remember? Maharaj is a Gayatri, like the Krishna Gayatri. Yeah, it may be the Kama Gayatri mantra, Klin Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopijana, Vallabhaya. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Because that is in all sampradayas it's given this mantra. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, the, that's the, it's called the Kama Gayatri mantra. It could be Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Maharaj. Well, that's not 18 syllables. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Is, is it 18? It's usually said it's a Krishna, the Gayatri Mantra only, Maharaj. Hmm? It's said it's the Gayatri Mantra only, Maharaj. It's Gayatri Mantra, yeah. So then it's the Kam Gayatri. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So the penance, this penance is the beauty and wealth of the brahmanas and the renounced order of life. So brahmanas, renunciation, it's for all devotees. All devotees are brahmanas. We're meant to be cultivating, situated in the mode of goodness. So renunciation is meant for everyone, not just for only those in the renounced order of life. It's not just only those who have taken like the vow of sannyas, but everyone who is practicing Krishna consciousness. They should, do, they should have that mode of renunciation, detachment from the material world and be willing to sacrifice everything for the pleasure of Krishna and their spiritual master. It's not a question of their position in society. It doesn't matter if they're brahmacharis or grihastas or sannyasis or what. But everyone should have that mood, that mood to be to be renounced, to, to be willing to accept hardships and difficulties and to go forward to, to preach Krishna consciousness. So, uh, we often reflect on the Krishna consciousness movement as it was in the 1960s and 70s and how it is today. 
and you know it it's quite there's the, the it's it is quite different because in in the 60s and 70s devotees were very bold and very renounced that Prabhupada could send them off to foreign countries with nothing to open temples and so <laughs> We don't always see that mood so much today. Although we do see it some places, there there is a lot of preaching going on. I recently I had the opportunity of traveling in India and visiting different places, and it's encouraging to see how many new centers have come up. One of the places which I visited was Rimuna. And I was pleased to see in Rimuna that there's an ISKCON center there. And the devotees there, they, they came there and they've managed to develop a center. And they have a, a nice temple coming up and they're doing very nice preaching there. So it's very encouraging to see devotees coming up and willing to go forward. And in fact, the devotees who I met in Ramuna, they were staying initially in Mumbai. They were coming from Mumbai, but they left everything to come there to Ramuna, to base themselves in Ramuna, in a smaller, small village there, and just cultivate Krishna consciousness and preach Krishna consciousness to the people there. So that, that is renunciation, that boldness to go forward and to go into places where there's nothing, where there's no temples, you know. Prabhupada definitely showed that example in his own life, how he went to America not knowing anybody and with no money, but he could go there to preach Krishna consciousness. And so that is the wealth of the renounced order of life. The, as one of the devotees mentioned, fearlessness. That they're not concerned about where will I get shelter or who will cook for me or who will take care of me. No, they're willing to go anywhere for the service of Lord Krishna. All right. So, Prabhupada writes in the purport, this tapa or penance was begun from the very beginning of the creation and it was first adopted by the Supreme Spiritual Master, Lord Brahma. By tapasya only can one get the profit of human life and not by a polished civilization of animal life. What is meant? A polished civilization of animal life. What is Prabhupada talking about? Right, yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Prabhupada said, the animal does not know anything except sense gratification. Hmm. But the human being is made to undergo tapasya for going back to Godhead, back home. And then? When Lord Brahma was perplexed about how to, how to construct the material manifestation in the universe and went down within the water to find out the means and the source of his lotus seat, he heard the words tapa vibrated twice. So Brahma was thus initiated by Lord Krishna. And this fact is corroborated by Brahmaji himself in his book, the Brahma Samhita. In the Brahma Samhita, Lord Brahma has sung in every verse, Govinda Madhi Pursham Tamaham Bhajami. Thus Brahma was initiated by the Krishna mantra, by Lord Krishna himself. And thus he became a Vaishnava or a devotee of the Lord before he was able to construct the huge universe. It is stated in the Brahma Samhita that Lord Brahma was initiated into the 18-letter Krishna Mantra, which is generally accepted by all the devotees of Lord Krishna. 
and we follow the same principle. We belong to the same. And then Prabhupada talks about the sampradaya and about being initiated also in the sampradaya. That, that's important. Get to connect, not just some initiation into a fam by a family guru, but you should be connected to a bona fide sampradaya. And in that way receive the proper knowledge. Then text 7, Brahma was unable to find out anyone besides himself. So he sat down on his lotus seat and he gave his intention, gave his attention to execution of penance as he had been instructed. So he couldn't see anyone else, he was alone. So a difficult situation, you know, when you're all alone, you're on your own, the beginning of the creation, could you imagine what it must be like to be there all on your own in the universe? And you, you have, you're the first person and then you hear this divine sound. But Brahma took the instruction to be divine and he took it very seriously. And he underwent penances for 1,000 years. I don't know, Dhananjaya Prabhu said, oh, it's not very long, it's, <laughs> it's just a fraction of time for Lord Brahma. But you don't think of it like that at the time, I mean, when you're doing it. You know, just like our time, you know, we don't think of our time as just being, oh, it's just a flash, it's just a moment. We're, we're, you know, we're thinking, uh, enjoying the time. We don't think, oh, I only have a short time, my 50 years, my 70 years is just a flash, just a, a one fraction of a breath of Mahavishnu. Rather, we have so many plans, we have so many things. Oh, my home, my family, my empire, my bank balance, everything, my education. So here is Brahma, Lord Brahma is doing his austerities and he controlled his mind and senses. He executed with a great lesson for the living entities. Thus he is known as the greatest of all aesthetics. So certainly Prabhupada is glorifying Lord Brahma here. He's appreciating that he did all of this. And then in the purport, Prabhupada writes, following the order of the bona fide spiritual master is the only duty of the disciple. And the completely faithful execution of the order of the bona fide spiritual master is the secret of success. So do you have any orders from your spiritual master? Anyone? Judy Gopi Maharaji? You have any orders from your spiritual master? Yes, Maharaj, to complete Bhakti Vaiva, to complete um, Bhakti Sarma. Really? Yes, Maharaj. Well, very nice. Who is your spiritual master? Maharaj, um, his name is Kratu Prabhu. Oh, Kratu Prabhu, yes. Okay. And he told you you should complete Bhakti Vaiva, yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Bhakti Vedanta, Bhakti Vaiva, and Bhakti Sarma. Oh, he wants you to go on and do Bhakti Vedanta also? Yeah. And back to Sarva Boma. Yes, oh, oh, you'll be busy your whole life. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Anybody else has an order from their spiritual master? Yes? Hello, Hare Krishna. I'm, I got orders to do Bhakti Viksha. To do Bhakti Vriksha. Yeah, programs and preach through Bhakti Vriksha. Oh, good. Program. Yes, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing many. So we, are... we get many devotees coming to Krishna consciousness from Bhakti Vriksha preaching. Please bless us, Maharaj, that we do it sincerely. 
Yes. You know, after you learn also Bhakti Shastri and Bhakti Vaibhav, you can also do the teacher's course and you can become a teacher. I met some devotees from M Mangalore. Now Mangalore is a, a, an incredible preaching is going on there. And it's all going on due to their uh, distribution of the classes. They're doing so many classes. They teach the Bhakti Shastri in 12 different languages. And they have 150 teachers. They have 150 teachers teaching Bhakti Shastri and Bhakti Vaibhav. And they're teaching in 12 different languages and they have five different levels also for studying Bhagavad Gita. So they're, this is all going on in Mangalore. And the devotees told me, they said, in the beginning they didn't have much of a congregation and they didn't have any money. But after they started promoting Bhakti Shastri and Bhakti Vaibhav and doing all the different courses, they got so many contacts, they got so many people interested in Krishna consciousness, and they all contributed donations for the welfare of their temple. So there's no scarcity if we go on preaching this Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada has given us everything. We just have to make use of it. So following the order of the spiritual master is the duty of the disciple. Now can you think of some people who didn't follow the order of the spiritual master? Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, it is Narad Muni himself, he didn't follow his order from uh, uh, Brahma Dev who is, happened to be his first spiritual master. What did he not do? He asked him to go for uh, increasing the progeny, but he has taken sannyas, and so he has been cursed that he will be born in, in, in the family of uh, uh, bed servant. Hmm? Father, by his father himself. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand what he was born Brahma in the family of a maid servant. Why? Because he didn't follow his father's order of uh, uh, adopting the garhasta and uh, increasing the progeny. Yeah. Why was he born the son of a maid servant? Of Brahma, uh, of Indra, they well, my understanding was that who was Narada Muni in his previous life before he became the son of a maid servant? Yes, right. What's that name? Upa? Yes, he was a Gandharva. Right? And uh, devotees there expected that he will sing spiritual songs, but he he did not do and then uh, they were, he cursed and then he was born as a... Yes, he was joking in the company of young women. He was a very good-looking Gandharva and he was joking in the company of the young ladies. So the Prajapatis cursed him. Maharaj, even Bali Maharaj, he didn't follow, like he disobeyed his spiritual master, so he was banished to Sutala. Right. Like, also, Maharaj, yes? Be a neg negative example because he followed Vaman Dev, no? In that case, so he, he was correct, but... In that case, he was correct, right? Yes, he gave up the order of his spiritual master to, to satisfy the Supreme Lord. What about Ramanujacharya? Ramanujacharya was given the mantra Om Namo Narayanaya and he was told not to tell anyone. But when he got the mantra, he went on the roof and told it to everyone. So 
So what happened there? Was Ramanuja wrong? Maharaj, for the benefit of all, he gave the mantra to everybody. Yeah, so so, he was, so the, did his guru appreciate? Guru did not appreciate, but he did correct because I think the guru later he accepted Yamunachare as a spiritual master. The Yamunacharya departed like before, uh, basically Mahakarna first initiated uh, Ramacharya. So, but mantra he got from a different, like his his spiritual master's um, god brother. I think it was mentioned he got mantra from his spiritual master's god brother, and he got very angry when you know he climbed off the pillar and told that mantra. But later, when he explained it was for the benefit, that person accepted that. Okay, it's okay. Yes, right. Thank you. So there are exceptions to following the order of the spiritual master. But generally the rule is we should be faithful to the order of the spiritual master. All right. And then we, we, we go ahead and text number 807. Oh, Nine. Oh, text 9. Sorry, text 9, yeah. The personality of Godhead being thus very much satisfied with the penance of Lord Brahma was pleased to manifest his personal abode, Vaikuntha, the supreme planet above all others. The abode of the Lord is adorned by all self-realized persons. So in the purport, we're told different things about Vaikuntha, the nature of the spiritual world, how to, how to appreciate it. Prabhupada quotes Brahma Samhita there, describing also the abode of the Lord. Right, the famous verse in the Brahma Samhita, Chantamani Prakarasadmasu. Like that, the, the abode of the Lord is made of Chantamani. And text 10 continues with more descriptions about this, the Lord's abode. And in this particular text, it, it's describing more about what the Vaikuntha, what the spiritual world is not. He said there's no predominance of the influence of time. And it cannot enter, one cannot enter that region. The illusory energy cannot enter that region. And both the demigods and the demons worship the Lord as devotees. So we, in previous chapters, we'd also heard about the Tripad Vibhuti, how the spiritual world, which is three times this material world, We hear about the, the, the spiritual realm that there's no ignorance there. There's only everything is of the nature, such as Ananda, full of bliss. So there's no influence of passion and ignorance. And there's no, the degrading influence of time is also not there. Material world, everyone's affected by time, but not here. Oh. Prabhupada quotes Jiva Goswami, he said, We can know from the Narada Pancharatna that the transcendental world or Vaikuntha atmosphere is enriched with transcendental qualities. These transcendental qualities, as revealed through the devotional service of the Lord, are distinct from the mundane qualities of ignorance, passion, uh, goodness. Such qualities are not attained by the non-devotee class of men. Hmm. 
The whole Vaikuntha existence proclaims that everyone there is a follower of the Lord. The Lord is a chief leader there without any competition for leadership and the people in general are all followers of the Lord. So that is the spiritual world. There's perfect harmony there. Everyone is happy, engaged in the service of the Lord. And then text 11 continues with a description of the inhabitants there in the Vaikuntha planets. Maharaj Parikshit had inquired about these things. He wanted to know about what is the nature of their life, the people who live there and everything. So they are described, their eyes are like lotus flower, their dress is of a yellowish color, their bodily features are very attractive. And they are just the age of growing youths. They all have four hands. They are all nicely decorated with pearl necklaces, ornamented, or, ornamental medallions, and they all appear to be effulgent. When, they, when uh, Ajamila had his encounter with the Vishnu Dutas and the Yama Dutas, then he saw that how the Vishnu Dutas were so, they were, they were so effulgent and they were so attractive, they were so pleasing. In great contrast to the Yama Dutas who were fearful, horrible looking people. So the inhabitants of Vaikuntha there's no old age there. They're all eternally youthful. In the spiritual world, everyone enjoys that. It was mentioned, it's mentioned in relation to the four Kumaras going to the spiritual world. How the inhabitants there were all of the same age, not like this world. Then text 12, Prabhupada said, there are some inhabitants who have attained the liberation of Sarupya, possessing bodily features like those of the Personality of Godhead. And the Vaidurya diamond is especially meant for the Personality of Godhead. But one who achieves the liberation of bodily equality with the Lord is especially favoured with such diamonds on his body. So, the Vaidurya diamonds, they're there also on the living end. What are the special features unique to the Supreme Lord? Is there any difference then between the Lord and the living entities? If it's mentioned here, some people can have also the Vaiduria diamonds. Is there any special feature which distinguishes the Lord from the other liberated souls in the spiritual world? They all have four hands and they're all effulgent, very beautiful, very pleasing. What are the, diff the particular features? of the Lord, which distinguish the Lord from the other inhabitants. He has a white tuft of hair on his chest and Srivastha smile. Yeah, the hair of Srivastha on the chest and also what, what is he wearing around his neck? Kastuba. Yes, the Kastuba. Like, yes, the Kastuba is a a special necklace, a special locket which he wears a lot around his neck. And what's on that Kastuba locket? There's a... There's a... Ka. Huh? Ka. Yes, right. Ka. Yes, right. Good. So those are the distinguishing features of the Lord. Yes. Text 13, Vaikuntha planets are surrounded by various aeroplanes, all glowing, brilliantly situated. These aeroplanes belong to the great Mahatmas or devotees of the Lord. The ladies are as beautiful as lightning, 
because of their celestial complexions. And all these combined together appear just like the sky decorated with both clouds and lightning. So we're hearing about Vaikuntha. Uh, I was, did I tell you, uh, I met this one Buddhist man and he was asking me, he said, in the spiritual world, do you have women there? He said, because in Buddhism, you know, everyone becomes a Buddha. So in, in their, in their, you know, in the, 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 the realm of Buddha, there's only Buddhas. There's no men and there's no women. There's only Buddhas. So he wanted to understand, how do we explain that in the spiritual world, there's men and women also? And here you can see that the ladies are as beautiful as lightning. So, is there any sex desire there in the spiritual world? No. No, right. Why not? Because everyone's so much in love with Krishna. When everyone's Krishna conscious, we just, we're so attracted to Krishna. We don't think about, oh, this woman, that. but still the ladies are very attractive and the men are very handsome and everything, everyone's very, but still, the, all the inhabitants of the spiritual world are pure devotees. They're liberated souls and they're completely absorbed in thought of Krishna. So they're not looking at this person, this man or this woman, right? So there's no material lust there in the spiritual world. So when I told him like that, he said, oh, very interesting. He thought very, he could, he could understand how we explain that, yes, there's women also in the spiritual world. Okay. Then takes, takes uh, 14, the goddess of fortune, she's engaged in the loving service of Krishna. Uh, moved by the black bees, followers of spring, she is not only engaged in variegated pleasure, service to the Lord, along with her constant companions, but is also engaged in singing the glories of the Lord's activities. So you can see the Goddess of Fortune, how she's fully engaged in devotional activities. She's doing service to the Lord and she's also singing the glories of the Lord as well. Text 15. Lord Brahma saw in the Vaikuntha planets the personality of Godhead, the Lord of the entire devotee community. And the Lord of the universe, who is served by his former servitors like Nanda, Sunanda, Prabhala and Arhana, his immediate associates. Purport, Prabhupada writes, so also, when we see the Lord, we see Him with His different energies, associates, confidential servitors, etc. So, the Supreme Lord, who is the leader of all living entities, the Lord of all devotee sects, the Lord of all opulences, the Lord of sacrifices and the enjoyer of everything in his entire creation is not only the Supreme Person, but also is always surrounded by his immediate associates, all engaged in their loving transcendental service to him. So this is the spiritual world. And you can see we have the, we're, we're cultivating the same mood by serving the deities. 
In our temples we have the deities and we're all engaged in similar services for the deity. Someone's cooking for the deities, someone's making nice dresses for the deities, someone's making flower garlands for the deities, other people are decorating the deities and making jewelry and then also you have to we have to decorate the altar we do so we're, in this way we're we're preparing ourselves for enter in, to enter into the spiritual world because in the spiritual world we'll do these things just as we do them here we'll go on and do them in the spiritual world so this is Sanatana Dharma, eternal religion. Can we have a break of five minutes? All right, yes. Let's have a break now. Five minutes, eh?
Okay, Hare Krishna. Can we continue? We're hearing about Lord Brahma, how he is actually he's having a vision of the Vaikuntha planets and he's able to see the personality of Godhead with his goddess of fortune and all the different associates of the Lord. His servants mentioned about the different, even the doorkeepers, the gatekeepers and so on, how they're all there with the Lord in the spiritual world. And then the beauty of the features of the Lord is described. And the Lord is described, he's seated on a throne, He's a, he's a, he's actually he's the factual sup, supreme lord, and he's in, enjoying his own abode. So that is the position of the lord. He, his position is to en, he's the supreme enjoyer. And Prabhupada describes this. He said, the supreme lord by his own potency is unlimitedly more powerful than any yogi. He is unlimitedly more learned than any jnani. He is unlimited, richer than any wealthy person. He is unlimitedly more beautiful than any beautiful living being and he is unlimitedly more charitable than any philanthropist. He is above all no one is equal to or greater than him, nor can anyone reach his level of perfection in any of the above powers by any amount of penance or yogic demonstration. The yogis are dependent on his mercy. Out of his immensely charitable disposition, he can award some temporary power to the yogis because of the yogis hankering after them. But to his unalloyed devotees who do not want anything from the Lord save and accept his transcendental service, the Lord is so pleased that he gives himself in exchange for unalloyed service. This is a point which is going to be uh, taken up in the next verse uh, where Sukadeva Goswami mentions about this is the way of the highest perfection for the living being, the Paramahamsa, the path of the Paramahamsa. Lord Brahma had seen the Supreme Lord, he was overwhelmed with joy, he's full of love and ecstasy. And Srila Prabhupada goes on, he talks about what is actually this path of the Paramahamsa and it's discussed here uh, that you can see the verse there in the purport, that important verse which is spoken by Lord Brahma in 10th canto uh, chapter 14, Lord Brahma's prayers are there. And this was the verse which Lord Chaitanya wanted when he was discussing with Ramananda Rai. Lord Chaitanya had asked Ramananda Rai to give a verse from the scriptures about the ultimate goal of life. And Ramananda Rai, first of all, spoke about Varnashram, and then he spoke about Karmarpana, and then he spoke about giving up all one's duties, and then he spoke about mixed devotion, and finally he came up with this verse, which is quoted in the purport. And when Lord Chaitanya heard this, he said, yes, he said, this is what we want. He said, this is the goal. This is devotional service. And kindly, kindly note the points which are there in this verse, but that you should simply hear about Krishna in the association of the devotees. Give up the path of philosophical speculation and then he thought about merging into the existence of the Lord. And just simply here, in the association of devotees, 
uh, stay in whatever position you are in. That's mentioned. Stane stita shruti gatan tanvan manobir. You stay in whatever position you are in, and by hearing about Krishna in this way, you lead an honest life uh, in the occupational engagement. Uh, conquer your sympathy and you, you can conquer your, your, your sympathy and mercy even though you are ajita or unconquerable. So Lord Brahma is speaking this verse to Lord Krishna. He's saying your sympathy and your compassion, your mercy. He's saying, Lord Krishna, you are ajita, you are unconquerable. <coughs> But you become conquered by the love of your devotee. So Lord Krishna becomes controlled by his devotees. This is the Paramahan, Paramahamsa Panta, the path of the Paramahamsa, the, the, the supreme path. You just simply hearing about Krishna in the association of devotees. And Lord Brahma had realized this also. So Lord Brahma followed this path. Lord Brahma is our Adi Guru. So seeing Lord Brahma before him, the Lord accepts him as worthy to create living beings. And being much satisfied with him, the Lord shook hands with Brahma and slightly smiling addressed him thus. So this is another interesting point, that the Lord shook hands with Brahma. Srila Prabhupada, in one place, he spoke about this. He said, this indicates to us that Lord Brahma is in Sakya Ras, because they shook hands. Lord Krishna and Lord Brahma shook hands. So he said, this indicates Lord Brahma is in Sakya Ras, friendship. Because usually people will shake hands when you're like equal, some equal, equality is there. So the Lord shook hands with Lord Brahma. We can understand how great Lord Brahma must have been, that the Lord was so pleased with him, that he came and shook hands with him. At the end of that purport, text 19, Prabhupada writes, Anyone, however, preaching the mission of the Lord in the line of the Brahma Sampradaya is always dear to the Lord, and the Lord being satisfied with su such a preacher of the authorized Bhakti cult shakes hands with him in great satisfaction. So Lord Brahma was a preacher. Our, our line, the Brahma Sampradaya, is the line of preachers. So Lord, the Lord then speaks to Lord Brahma and says, I'm very pleased with your, all, all the austerities you've done. He says, hardly, I am, hardly am I pleased with the pseudo-mystics. So the pseudo-mystics, they're not pleasing to the Lord, but the Lord is pleased with the long accumulated penances done by Lord Brahma. Text 21, the Lord says, I wish you good luck, and you may ask from me all that you may desire. You may know that the ultimate benediction is the result of all penance, is to see me by realization. So we could say, Lord Brahma has already achieved the ultimate benefit. He's, he's, he's got the personal audience of the personality of Godhead. 
Prabhupada writes in the purport, when one realizes the Supreme Lord, one does not struggle hard to perform such penances. The next stage of life is to discharge devotional service to the Lord just to satisfy Him. In other, one, in other words, one who has realized and seen the Lord has attained all perfection because everything is included in that highest perfectional stage. This highest perfectional ingenuity is the personal perception of my abode, and this has been possible because of your submissive attitude in the performance of severe penance according to my order. The highest perfectional stage of life is to know the Lord by actual perception, by the grace of the Lord. This can be attained by everyone who is willing to discharge the act of devotional service to the Lord as enjoined in the revealed scriptures that are standard and accepted by the bona fide acharyas. For example, Bhagavad Gita is the approved Vedic literature accepted by all the great acharyas such as Shankara, Ramanuja, Madhva, Chaitanya, Vishwanath, Baladev, Siddhanta Sarasati and many others. And in the Bhagavad Gita, the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, asks that one always be mindful of Him, always be His devotee, always worship Him only and always bow down before the Lord. And by doing so, one is sure to go back home, back to Godhead without any doubt. In other places also, the same order is there, that one give up all other engagements and fully surrender without hesitation. And the Lord will give such a devotee all protection. These are the secrets of attaining the highest perfectional stage. Lord Brahma exactly followed these principles without any superiority complex and thus he attained the highest perfectional stage of experiencing the abode of the Lord and the Lord himself with all his paraphernalia. So Srila Prabhupada is describing Brahma's mood and performing his austerities. Lord, the, the Personality of Godhead goes on speaking to Brahma and he explains to Brahma, he said, uh, such penance is my heart and soul and therefore penance and I are non-different. So th this is an important point we should understand. That the penance is the internal potency of the Lord and it's non-different from Him. Just like chanting the Holy Name is non-different from the Lord. A devotee was chanting the Holy Name, he was giving a lecture one time and Prabhupada was there. Prabhupada had asked this devotee to give the class about the chanting of the Holy Name. And the devotee said, Krishna is in His name. But Prabhupada said, no. He said, that's not quite correct. He said, he said, Krishna is his name. They're not different. Nam Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Ratha Vigraha. Purna Shuddha Nitya Mukto Nam Nama Namino. The holy name of Krishna and Lord Krishna himself are not different. And this point is made here, Lord Krishna, well, the personality of Godhead, maybe Lord Krishna, he's speaking about penance. And this penance, of course, when we speak about penance, what's meant is devotional service. Because it's only by devotional service that we can actually see the Lord. So, the practice of devotional service is not different 
from the Lord Himself. It is the internal potency of the Lord. And Prabhupada said that devotional service includes knowledge and detachment. What's the best? Devotional service includes knowledge and detachment. You know the verse? Yes, I, I think so. Yes, Vasudevi Bhagavati. By application of devotional service, one automatically acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. <coughs> There's also the verse Bhakti Parishanuvavo Viraktir and Yatra Chaisa Tre E Kakala. The, the example was given just like by eating. You, when you eat food, a hungry man eats food, he feels relief from hunger, satisfaction and nourishment, one after another. In the same way, uh, when we practice devotional service, there must be detachment from the material world and the awakening of transcendental knowledge. It should all be there within the path of devotion. This is the application of actual devotional service. So penance is being glorified here, again, but penance being, of course, devotional service. Oh, Krishna. At the end of the purport of 23, therefore only love and penance combined can please the Lord, and thus one is able to attain his complete mercy. He directs the sinless, and the sinless devotees attain the highest perfection of life. And then the Lord describes how He Himself creates the cosmos by such pen penance. I maintain it by the same energy, and I withdraw it all by the same energy. Therefore, the potency, the, the the potency is penance only. And Prabhupada uses this point to talk about going back to Godhead. We have to decide, do we want to take the trouble to go back to Godhead? Are we ready to undergo the penances necessary to go back to Godhead? Yes, Maharaj. Are you ready to do that, are you? Pra Prabhupada writes, the Lord is more clever than any living entity. Therefore, he wants to see how painstakingly the devotee is in devotional service. The order is received from the Lord, either directly or through the bona fide spiritual master. And to execute that order, however painstaking, is the severe type of penance. One who follows the principle rigidly is sure to achieve success in attaining the Lord's mercy. Just like duty gopis painstakingly studying Bhakti Vaibhav, and she's going to go on and study Bhakti Vedanta and Bhakti Sarvabhoma. She's going to dedicate her life to studying Prabhupada's books. Painstaking, right? It's a lot of work. There's a lot of slokas to be memorized, a lot of essays to be written. Very nice. Yes, painstaking. But that trouble, that in itself, that is, that is the, the nectar. That if we get something very easily, we don't appreciate it. So we 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 that that having to make greater effort for something, we will value it more when we get it. But if you get something very easily, it's, you don't think much of it. 
So Lord Krishna is very careful in giving that pure love and allowing us to go back to God. He wants to see that we're willing to undergo the difficulties to, in order to get there. And Prabhupada also expected devotees to do that. Put them, he put devotees through a lot of difficult. Go out and distribute books. Prabhupada wanted us to distribute books. So which text are we on? Twenty-five. Okay. All right, we heard about endeavors. Going on to 26. 25 we'll be starting now. I thought we did 25. I spoke about the endeavoring. Manish, you spoke about that 24th. Uh, are we ready? Oh, that was 24, was it? Yes, Yeah, okay, so 25. All personality of Godhead situated in every living entity's heart. As the Supreme Director, you are aware of all endeavors by your superior intelligence without any hindrance whatsoever. So the hindrances are there in the material world. So Lord Brahma is speaking again, we, we heard from Lord Krishna, now Lord Brahma is speaking again and he is asking, he is going to ask the Lord some questions. He said, you are aware of all endeavours without any hindrance whatsoever. Lord Krishna knows everything, he knows about the endeavours of the living entities. So Lord Brahma prays, text 26. Kindly fulfill my desire. May I please be informed how in spite of your transcendental form, you assume the mundane form, although you have no such form at all. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy question to understand. Understand what I don't... Prabhupada, Jayadvaita Swami told me that Prabhupada told him that he shouldn't try to edit the second canto. He said, just leave it as it is. And Jayadvaita Swami wanted to edit it. I could understand why. Some of the sentences are not so easy to understand. Anyway, uh, 27. Please be informed. How, uh, please inform me how you by your own self manifest different energies for annihilation, generation, acceptance and maintenance by combination and permutation. So we're going to hear about the Lord's energies. We want to understand the different features. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, in other words, there is nothing but the Lord, and still it, the Lord is different from all such manifestive activities. How is it so will be explained later on. Then Brahma, Maharaj, yes? We were, in the, we were in the questions of Parikshit Maharaj, and now Brahma has started asking questions to Krishna. Yes, now Brahma is asking questions. We're going to hear the Chatur Sloki. Well, it's being described by Sukadeva Goswami. He's describing similar questions which Maharaj Parikshit had brought up, being asked again by Lord Brahma.
So text 28, Lord Brahma gives an example, he said, you play like a spider that covers itself by its own energy and your determination is infallible. So he said, please tell me philosophically all about all the energies, all the energies which you have. So the example of the spider often comes in Prabhupada's purports, we will hear it. Why is this relevant to Krishna consciousness? Who can explain the example of the spider? How does it relate to Krishna consciousness? What does the spider do? What's the unique features of the activities of the spider? Uh, it, creates, it creates the web and then it, uh, as it wants, it can again withdraw it. Right. From the, where does it create its web from? From its, its body. From its own body, he creates a web and he maintains it for some time, and then he will bring that web back into his own body. So how does that relate to the universe? One person? Maharaj, he creates, uh, uh, maintain, and then it uh, 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 annihilates. So so basically, this all creations, maintenance, and annihilation, it is all going with his mercy only. It's coming from his body, right? From the body of Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu yeah. is laying on the Kosho ocean. Everything is coming out from him. And it goes back. And he's been overseeing the maintenance, and at the end, he will order the dissolution of the universe. Okay. Mm. Then text 29 said, Please tell me so that I may be taught in the matter of the instructions of the personality of Godhead and may thus act instrumentally to generate living entities without being conditioned by such activities. So Brahma is concerned that he shouldn't become proud of what he's doing, becoming conditioned. You think, think we think I'm the doer. So Bra Lord Brahma is very conscious of that, that he's going to be doing some work in, by way of generation, generating living entities, but he, he wants to keep himself in good consciousness and not to think that he's actually the doer, but remembering that he is the servant. And then in text 30, you've shaken hands, you've shaken hands with me, just as a friend, as with a friend. I shall be engaged in the creation of different types of living entities, and I shall be occupied in your service. I shall have no perturbation, but I pray that all this may not give rise to pride as if I were the Supreme. So Lord Brahma is very cautious about this. He's really worried about thinking himself to be the Supreme. That's something, Lord Brahma, of course, he's in that big position at the top of the universe. But even though we are insignificant, we still also, we, are, we get the same problem. We're thinking, I'm the doer, I'm so great. Every living being is eternally the servant of the Lord. He is the Supreme. We're simply meant to engage in His service. All right, and then text 31, we'll hear how Krishna responds to these questions, how He will reply. So we'll begin that tomorrow. Are there any questions?
We have to go through the Chatur Sloki, the four verses. Oh, tomorrow is no class, next week. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have one, one question. Yes. Yeah. So in this, uh, 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 this uh, chapter, when Brahma is, uh, first of all, he heard the word Tapa. So this Tapa, because uh, it also says that uh, Brahma uh, can only approach to Shiro Daksha Vishnu, even he cannot able to approach to Garvot Daksha Vishnu, because that is how he moved in the lotus stem and he could not reach anywhere and he went back and, and definitely he cannot approach to uh, Mahavishnu. So all these interactions, what we are talking about, that is about uh, the interaction with Shiro uh, Daksai Vishnu and Shiro Daksai Vishnu in turn is showing his dham, that is uh, uh, the Bhakkund dham. So is that understanding correct? Because uh, well, I don't know about this. Is, is that you're saying that his vision of Vaikuntha was actually in Sweta Dweep? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and that was also the reason because he never seen the Krishna. So uh, when he has seen the Krishna, uh, uh, when he appeared on this earth, so he, he got confused because he, he, before that he never had any interaction with Krishna. So that is also the reason that Brahma got confused and he made mistakes of perception. Mm. Well. It might be like that. It's an interesting presentation. That, that point is not made in any of the commentaries of the Acharyas. But Maharaj, then uh, how come? Because maybe first time he is getting confused, but every day of Brahma, uh, again now once the first day of Brahma, when he has come across Krishna and his illusion has been removed. So is it that when the end of the day, when he goes to the sleep and all the jiva goes into dissolutions, so at that time again his memory is also erased and that's why every Brahm, uh, Bhimohan Leela is getting repeated every day of Brahma? Hmm. Yes. Certainly the pastimes of the Lord are going on eternally. Every day does he have to go through this? <laughs> it's, so you would, we would consider that the experience, the, the, humili the humiliation of Brahma, the big total bewilderment of Brahma, you wouldn't want to repeat the thing, you know, you make a mistake, you wouldn't want to make that same mistake again. But we do hear that this uh, pastime is going on continually. How can we understand these things? It's all simply the yoga maya of the Lord. The Lord arranges all of these different pastimes for his pleasure, for the pleasure of his devotees. So Lord Brahma, we could say Lord Brahma, he has, he goes through this. Of course, the Madhvas, the Madhva, followers of Madhvacharya, they took this pastime out because they didn't like to hear about the bewilderment of Lord Brahma, Lord Brahma being the Adi Guru. They, they didn't like, they, they didn't accept this pastime. Brahma Vimohan, they thought this is not, not proper, he's our Adi Guru, how could he ever be bewildered? Anyway, uh, 
your point is noted. I, I'll think more about it and I'll discuss with other authorities about this and I'll see what I can find out. What the other what other people think about this and you, you know was it actually simply the Lord is speaking to Shuradaka Shai Vishnu there in Sweta Dweep? Or who is he speaking to? It's an interesting point. You know, there are so many things in Srimad Bhagavatam, we can never know all the answers. But certainly your point is good and we'll, we'll think more about it and try to find, try to do some research on this and try to come up with something. So thank you for this. Yes, someone else has a hand up here, is it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Brahma Samhita, Brahma Ji is saying, Bolo ka namni niya dhami tale chatasya devi mahesa hai dhama su se su se. So, here, uh, Brahma Ji uh, saw Krishna planet or Vaikuntha loko. Krishna loko or Vaikuntha loko. Your question is, is Brahma Loka? No. Uh, Brahma Samhita Krishna says, Goloka Namni Nijadhami Tale Chatasya. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Dhamma Sute Sute Sute. So here Brahma Ji is, is saying Krishna Loka or Vaikuntha Loka. Well, it's mentioned as Vaikuntha Loka. It's simply mentioned as Vaikuntha Loka. But in the Brahma Samhita, he says, Goloka Namni Nijad Hamni. So Krishna's own abode is Golok Rundavan Dham, and below that, where presently we are in Devi Dham, on top of Devi Dham, Mahid Dham, on top of Mahid Dham is Hari Dham, Vaikuntha Dham. Yes. But we know there's, there's also Vaikuntha, right? It's not just Goloka and then Devi Dham. There's also Vaikuntha. There's a distinction. Prabhupada, in the purports we don't hear anybody talk about Goloka, they're simply saying Vaikuntha. The Lord revealed Vaikuntha to uh, Brahma. Later on, of course later on it does come about that Brahma got darshan of the Lord in Vrindavan. That comes later. But initially, at the beginning of the creation, his first vision of the Lord was simply of the Vaikuntha. And it's described, the Lord has four arms and so on. So it's definitely not Goloka. Hmm? Well, of course, there's many Vaikuntha planets, there's many planets in the spiritual world. Lord Brahma saw in the Vaikuntha planets the personality of Godhead. So, in all the Vaikuntha planets the Lord is there. You, you want to understand, is it, are there many Vaikuntha planets or just one Vaikuntha planet? I just wanted to know whether Brahmaji saw one Vaikuntha 
uh, that at this at the same time he's seeing all the Vaikundas. Well, it says plural. It does say plural. He saw in the Vaikuntha planets. There are many issues there to try to understand by kothas, you know, without our realization. We need somebody to go there and come back and enlighten us all on the actual nature of the spiritual world. But, huh? If somebody goes there, he doesn't come back here. Yeah, right. No, we do have Sanatana Goswami's Brihad Bhagavatamrita. And he, he, the way he describes it, it does seem like Vaikuntha, he just talks about one place, you know, Vaikuntha. He doesn't talk like that there's many planets, he's not talking about many planets, but he's just talking about one place. And then further away, there's Ayodhya and some other place, there's, uh, you know, Mathura and Dwarka. But we don't hear about the many planets which are there in Vaikuntha. But we do get some vision, some understanding about the spiritual world by the grace of Sanatana Goswami. It's mentioned in the second half of the Brihad Bhagavata Amrita, Gop Kumar, and how he goes to Goloka and his journey through the different places. Hmm. All right, so we have to go on next week. We'll have to cover the Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam. We'll go through these four verses and try to pick out the main points, the essence of these four verses. So the questions are mentioned. You can uh, where are the four the four the four questions are there in one of the purports. There are the four questions. Oh, right. In text 31 in the purport, right. The four questions are listed. First one, what are the forms of the Lord, both in matter and in transcendence? How are the different energies of the Lord working? How does the Lord play with his different energies? And how may Brahma be instructed to discharge this uh, duty. Entrusted to him. So those are the four questions. And just like in Bhagavad Gita, we see in the Bhagavad Gita there's a Chatur Sloki Bhagavad Gita, which summarizes the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. So similarly here, the, these four verses are spoken by the Supreme Lord, and they are describing the essence of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the original Bhagavatam, spoken by the Lord Himself to Lord Brahma. And it's describing Sambandha, Abhidaya, and Prayojana. The four different levels of knowledge are there within these verses. Sambandha, Gyan, knowledge of the relationship, Abhidaya, knowledge of the process, and Prayojana, the goal of the process. 
So we'll look at these four verses in some detail in, on, in the next class, which will be on Friday. Is Friday also Ram Nomi? Thursday it is Ram Nomi. Oh, Thursday, Thursday is Ram Nomi. Okay, yeah. Thursday is Ram Nomi. Friday is, uh, yeah, Friday is, uh, we can have class. Okay. okay. Friday and Saturday. All right. So, any other questions? If there are no questions, then we will stop here. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.